Our reading comes from Paul's letters, letter to the Romans, in the sixth chapter, beginning in the twelfth verse. And I will be reading from the Common English Bible. Now listen to this reading of God's word. So then, don't let sin rule your body so that you do what it wants. Don't offer parts of your body to sin, to be used as weapons to do wrong. Instead, present yourselves to God as people who have been brought back to life from the dead, and offer all the parts of your body to God to be used as weapons to do right. Sin will have no power over you because you aren't under the law, but under grace. So what? Should we sin because we aren't under law but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, that you are slaves to the one whom you obey? That's true whether you serve as slaves of sin, which leads to death, or as slaves of the kind of obedience that leads to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you gave wholehearted obedience to the teaching that was handed down to you, which provides a pattern. Now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking with ordinary metaphors because of your limitations. Once, you offered the parts of your body to be used as slaves to impurity and to lawless behavior that leads to still more lawless behavior. Now, you should present the parts of your body as slaves to righteousness, which makes your bodies holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What consequences did you get from doing things that you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God, you have the consequence of a holy life, and the outcome is eternal life. The wages that sin pays are death. But God's gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's July the 2nd, which means that 2023 is half over. Can you believe that? Um, Just just to depress you at how quickly time goes. Um, We learned last night about an hour before it happened that Abingdon town fireworks were last night and not Tuesday on July the 4th. We were over an hour away from home when it happened, so, so we missed all but the end. We got in town just, just as the fireworks were ending and saw some of the, the beauty of them. And, and then we heard what I expect I'll hear probably until September was everybody's homemade fireworks shows that, that all of your dogs and, and animals at your house love. Pop, 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 pop. Um, and it's one of the few times I've been thankful that our, our dog, uh, who's 16 years old, has lost all of her hearing because now the 4th of July, which used to be her least favorite time of year, she, she doesn't even care. Um, this week, we will be using a word an awful lot, and that word is freedom. It's Independence Day that we are celebrating, and it's right that we have this holiday and that we do the things that we do and we have the traditions that we have. But the passage that Glenn read from Romans 6 talks about what it means to be free in Christ. What is the Bible's vision for freedom? And so we want to talk about that because it's not exactly the same thing that we might mean when we talk about freedom this week. So as Christians, we want to discipline our thinking and our speech about freedom, put, put our thinking of freedom under the discipline of Christ. I was reading a little bit this week 
you ever go on one of these rabbit holes online looking up one thing and then oh, thought of this and thought of this and thought of this and before you know it, you know a whole lot about a lot of stuff that's not very meaningful. But I, I was reading this week again about uh, a man named George Mallory who in the 1920s was going to climb Mount Everest. You all know Mount Everest, the tallest peak in the entire world. It stands just over 29,000 feet high. Now for comparison, Mount Rogers, which we love here in Virginia, the highest peak in Virginia. Does anybody know how high that is? Just under 6,000 feet. And if you've been up there, if you've been up on White Top, because you can't really see anything from Mount Rogers, but if you go out to White Top or to Grayson Highlands, you can see forever and you feel like you're on top of the world. Yeah, you're up high, but you're up about 6,000 feet. You go up to Mount Everest, 29,000 feet, my mind, I can't wrap my mind around it. In Colorado, there are several 14,000 foot, 14, 000, um, mountains that are 14,000 feet high. One of them is called Pikes Peak. And I went there a little over 20 years ago with my family. And we, we drove up to the top and we got out of the car, 14,000 feet high, and the air was so thin, I nearly passed out. <gasps> I was with my, my brother, two years younger than me. I always liked looking tougher than him. I looked so pitiful that day. I was with my father and my grandfather, who was 82 years old at the time, and they all did fine, but I, was, I nearly passed out. The air was so thin, and that's it, 14,000 feet Mount Everest is over twice as high at 29,000 feet. George Mallory was going to climb Mount Everest, and he did climb, and some people think he may have been the first person on record to reach the summit of Mount Everest, but he and his companion actually died on the descent, so we'll never know, and that was in 1924. Body wasn't found until 1999. I told you, you learn all kinds of useless and wonderful stuff online. Before George Mallory climbed Mount Everest, Someone asked him, why would you want to do a thing like that? Why would you want to climb Mount Everest? Does anybody remember what he said? Because it's there. Because it's there. Now, isn't that a great American thing to say? Because it's there. Only he was British. But because it's there. Because it's there. Because it's there. It reminded me of a friend I have who just, uh, after college, entered into teaching elementary school. She was well prepared for it, had done her student teaching, but there was still, uh, just jumping in at the deep end once you're out there and really uh, doing that for the first time. And she said, it's great, the, the kids are cute, the kids are sweet, the kids are lovely, these elementary she's, school students, she said, but you know some of them, even the smallest ones, some of the smallest ones are wicked. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, the other day, one of them misbehaved, did something I had explicitly told him not to do, and it, and it hurt another child. And I said, why did you do that? And he looked up at me, and he said, because I could. Because I could. Because it's there. Because I could. I wish we left that behind um, in childhood, but I was listening to another friend talk, and he he had an acquaintance who had this pattern of starting relationships with women and, and after they'd been dating a while, he would just end it abruptly, just what we say to now, nowadays, he would just ghost them. He would break their heart. He would hurt them. He did that over and over again. And my friend said, why, why do you do that? And he said the same thing that the little child said. He said, because I can. Because I can. If I had to ask you for a quick definition of what freedom is, most of us might answer that freedom is, well, it's to do more or less what we want. But I came today to tell you that if your definition of freedom involves hurting other people, that's not freedom. Being free to harm other people, if we exercise our freedom in that way, that is not freedom. We have this belief that freedom is the absence of restraint. No, no claim on my time, no, nothing encumbering me, that's freedom. Well, it might be, but it might not be. It depends on what we do with that freedom. With that freedom, we might do something great. 
We might love people well. We might give generously. Or we might live very selfishly. Or we might harm somebody. There's more to freedom than the absence of restraint. We might even harm ourselves. I would remind you that in the AA, the Alcoholics Anonymous community, one of the things that they say over and over again is your own best thinking got you here. Your own best thinking got you here. Sometimes the worst thing that we can have is exactly what we want. There's got to be more to freedom than the absence of restraint. But, but think about the way that we talk about it. Think about the way we talk about our time. If I could just get some free time, what do we mean by that? Well, that's time where there's nothing on my calendar, time where nobody has a claim on me, time where I have no obligation, as if that really exists. But we strive for it. Oh, my goodness, we strive for it. Our vision of what, what the ideal vacation is, and, and i got to tell you, this appeals to me, is going to some remote place and sitting on a beach or sitting on a mountaintop with, with, with nobody asking anything. I, I love you all. I'm not, this is not a game. But it, it, it's appealing, isn't it? And we think that that's what freedom is. Look at how we talk about our resources. That part of our bank account that we, that we have or, or we would like to have to get ourselves treats or knickknacks or things that we've always wanted, what do we call that? We call it disposable income. Disposable income. And there's just sort of this fence around it. If it's disposable income, then what can I do with it? Whatever I want. And that's okay up to a point. But as Christians, again, we have to ask, what do we really mean by freedom? And I think all I want us to understand is the difference between two words. There is a difference between freedom from and freedom for. We tend to think that freedom is just freedom from. Freedom from any kind of thing that would hold us back. Freedom from anything that would tell me what to do, that would hold me down. And when we define freedom as simply freedom from, we come up short. The Christian vision for freedom is freedom for. Paul says, you have been set free from sin and death for Jesus Christ. Previously, you belonged to sin and death. Now, you belong to Jesus Christ. Freedom for God. Real freedom is found in belonging to God. And in belonging to God, we can give freely and serve others freely and love others in Jesus' name. That is real freedom. I'm still thinking about Vacation Bible School. It could be because there's pictures on the bulletin and there's pictures in the hallway, but I find myself still singing the songs that we sang at Vacation Bible School, and I'm not going to tell you one way or another if I'm still doing the dance moves to, to what we did because I don't want you to uh, ever see me dance because that's not something that I do in public. But I, I might still be even doing some of the hand motions. I can still taste. I can still taste the pizza and the hot dogs and the chicken nuggets from vacation. You know, the three major food groups of children's ministry. I can still, I can still taste the goodness of vacation Bible school. I can still hear the laughter. Kathleen and I had the blessing of teaching the Bible story portion. And I wanted to have the kids learn their way around the Bible because that's going to be our children's ministry emphasis coming up. And so I got out the Bible and made sure everybody had a Bible. And we worked on finding our place in the Bible. And th this happened to be Matthew chapter 2. I said, let's see if we can find Matthew chapter 2. And they, oh, well, we need help. We need help. So we went around the circle until every child could find Matthew chapter 2. And I said, now, now let's, let's look at it. Let's, let's, let's learn this story. And I'll never forget, one little boy looked up at me after we'd all found Matthew chapter 2. And he was holding his Bible. And he said, Pastor Paul, I can't read. I said, it's okay, it's okay, buddy. You can still learn, you can still learn the story. But I thought in that, in that circle, and in, especially in that young man's face, that's really all of us. We all need help. We all need a lot of help when it comes to understanding the Bible. The Bible, uh, most Bibles are over a thousand pages long. The newest part of the Bible is 2,000 years old. It was written in languages that we don't speak or read. We need help. And so I want to lift up for you today two words that, to me, help to unlock the Bible. Now, this is not Cliff's Notes. This is not what you read instead of the Bible. You still read the Bible, but this helps unlock the Bible. It helps unlock everything that we do and say here in church. And there are two words that will be familiar to a lot of you, and those words are Exodus 
and Easter. Can you say those words? Exodus and Easter. Do you remember the story of the Exodus? God's people were slaves in Egypt. I, I know I tell this story all the time. There's a reason. It's because this is one of the keys to understanding the whole thing. But God's people were slaves in Egypt. Pharaoh looked at God's people. These are people that God had said to them, I will be your God and you will be my people. And Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who thought he was the most powerful person in the world, said, no, you're mine. He used the favorite word of a two-year-old. Mine, mine, mine. You are mine. And God sent Moses. He said, you go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. No, they are not your people, Pharaoh. They are my people. And God freed his people. They walked across on dry land. They were set free. That's the exodus. On a Friday afternoon, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was dead on a cross. He hung there nailed to the beams of wood. He had breathed his last. He was dead. And they took him off the cross and they put him in a tomb and they rolled a rock in front of it. And when they sealed that tomb... Jesus' dead body inside. The devil, death, sin, all of the forces of evil said of Jesus, He's mine. He's ours. And God on Easter said, No, this is my son. And the light shined in the darkness, and Jesus breathed again and was raised from the dead. Exodus and Easter. Why do I tell you that story? Because in those two stories are the, the key to everything else in Scripture. It tells us everything we really need to know about God. Our God is a God of life, a God of love, a God of liberation, a God of resurrection. It also tells us the truth about our human condition. There are forces that seek to enslave us, that look at us and say, Mine, you belong to me. Sin says you belong to me. Death says you belong to me. And God has said to us in Jesus Christ, no, you belong to me. And that's where real freedom is found, is in knowing that we belong to God. Have you ever watched someone like Carol or, or, or Lisa, one of our musicians, play the piano or the organ? Now, I know just enough to be dangerous, but really, if I just went over there, I could just go bonk, 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 and it would just be the awfulest noise you ever heard. And I would say, but I'm doing what I want. I'm free. Look at me. Ding, 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 ding. But then Carol sits down and she begins to play. But you know what? She's been playing her whole life, I wager. And she, I know she practices a lot because she came in this week to practice on this particular instrument to get ready for today. And she practiced for a couple of hours to be ready for this service. And in that discipline... She has freedom to sit down and play nearly anything that she wants. It's true for athletes. You don't just run out on the basketball court and start shooting three-pointers and layups. You don't just run out onto the softball field and know how to field a fly ball and throw and hit the cutoff and the cutoff throws to home. That takes practice. That takes discipline. But once it happens, there's freedom in that. It's a freedom for something. And Christian freedom means learning and knowing and accepting that we belong to God in Jesus Christ. The first question that you need to ask is always not what can I get for myself, but the question is always what can I do with what God has given me to serve God and to love others? There's a great hymn that we don't sing very often. I'm just going to read you some of the words from it. It actually um, is in both Spanish and English in our hymnal. But it goes, the words go like this. When we are living, it is in Christ Jesus, and when we're dying, it is in the Lord. Both in our living and in our dying, we belong to God. We belong to God mid times of sorrow and in times of pain. When sensing beauty or love's embrace, whether we suffer or sing rejoicing, we belong to God. We belong to God across this wide world. We shall always find those who are crying with no peace of mind. But when we help them or when we feed them, we belong to God. We belong to God. And that is the good news for us today. Thanks be to God.